Our next speaker is Jennifer Jaquette. She's an assistant professor in the Department of Env Environmental Studies at New York University. She's an environmental social scientist interested in large-scale cooperation dilemmas with interest in overfishing, climate change, and the wildlife trade. She has a new book coming out in early 2015. It's called Is Shame Necessary? And it's about the evolution, function, and future of the use of social disapproval. Hopefully she'll tell us a little bit about that in her talk. Let's welcome Jennifer to the stage. Well, I have to go after a philosopher and a physicist, so um, my talk's going to be quite literal about extinction of species. And I actually stay up at night worried about this. I know that sounds, well, maybe to some of you that's a normal thing to do, but I even spoke to a woman uh, who studies survivor guilt and asked her if she has many patients who complain that you know, the human species is surviving while all these other species go extinct. And she said it was not a presenting symptom. So um, maybe I'm a little strange. I think it's a misplaced anxiety about my own mortality. But I am worried about the 870 or so species that have gone extinct since the 16th century which I would call conspicuous extinction, things that we are watching disappear. And I think that extinction is itself a little misleading because it's this really binary category. You're either alive and, or you're extinct. And we, we know, though, that while there are these 870 special species, and there are certain ones that, that, to me, stand out, there are also a bunch of other species on the brink, which people like Jonathan Bailey spoke about. And um, I'll get into those in a, in a moment. But some of the species that I stay up worrying about, um, and mostly m lamenting, and I, I know I'm not alone on this because a friend of mine is um, really torn up that there are no longer um, giant sloths around, uh, he, is the stellar sea cow, which went extinct in 1768, uh, just after 27 years of having been discovered uh, by the Russians, although the Aleuts knew they were there. And um, another species that I'll mention and speak about is the Pinta Island giant tortoise, uh, Lonesome George. So the first one, uh, the stellar sea cow, the largest sirenian uh, that ever lived, and a close relative of, of the manatee or the dugong, lived up in uh, the Aleutian Territory, Alaska. And the records that we have of it really are from, from George Steller, the naturalist. And this is a, an excerpt from uh, his writing I just wanted to share with you because it's um, the kind of thing that makes me wish they were still around. So he writes, um, they're not afraid of man in the least, nor do they seem to hear very poorly, as Hernandez asserts, contrary to experience. Signs of a wonderful intelligence, whatever Hernandez might say, I could not observe, but indeed an uncommon love for one another, which even extended so far that when one of them was hooked, all the others were intent upon saving him. Seven tried to prevent the wounded comrade from being drawn on the beach by forming a closed circle around him. Some attempted to upset the yawl. Others laid themselves over the rope or tried to pull the harpoon out of his body, in which, indeed, they succeeded several times. Uh, we also noticed, not without astonishment, that a male came two days in succession to its female, which was lying dead on the beach, as if he would inform her, himself about her condition. Nevertheless, no matter how many of them were wounded or killed, they always remained in one place. Big mistake, <laughs> sea cow. No, so this is the, these are the kind of historical, ecological records that we have of the sea cow, which um, is no longer around, and which I think um, m makes me a little less fulfilled as a human being. This other case, um, so, so I, I sort of dream about the sea cow or imagine what they would be like to see in the wild, but the case of the Pinta Island giant tortoise was a particularly strange feeling for me personally because I had spent many days, many afternoons, in the Galapagos Islands when I was a volunteer with the Sea Shepherd Conservation Society in Lonesome George's sort of den with him. Because if any of you visited the Galapagos, you know that you can actually even feed the giant tortoises that are in the Charles Darwin Research Station. And this is Lonesome George here, um, lived to a ripe old age, but uh, failed, as they pointed out many times, to reproduce. And just recently, uh, in 2012, he died, and with him, the last of his species. And he was couriered to the American Museum of Natural History and, uh, and taxidermied there. And a couple weeks ago, his body was unveiled. 
Uh, this was the unveiling that I attended. And at this exact moment in time, I can say that I was feeling a little like I am now, actually, um, nervous and kind of nauseous, while everyone else seemed sort of calm. And I wasn't really prepared to, to see uh, Lonesome George. Here he is, um, taxidermy, looking out over Central Park, which was strange as well. But I, at that moment, realized that I knew the last individual of the species to go extinct. And I think that presents this strange predicament for us to be in in the 21st century, this idea of conspicuous extinction. So as I mentioned, it's this binary category. But there is another one, uh, another category that scientists like to use of ecological extinction. And again, these were some of the species that have already been mentioned, like the pangolin or things living on the edge. And these are species that haven't had that final curtain call, but are, they don't really perform their ecological function in the natural world as they once did. So the 500 remaining mountain gorillas or four remaining um, northern white rhino match this category. And there are about 17,000 known species in this category. But a, a big overlooked group that I uh, work on is in the oceans. So fish and wildlife, uh, which we call seafood, um, are also part of this ecological extinction. And a friend of mine uh, went into, this is, to me, so conspicuous that it's happened since the 1950s, since people were taking photographs of their, the largest fish they've ever caught uh, in the Florida Keys. So she went into newspapers in which, uh, in the archives, people had submitted photographs of their best ever fishing day. And what's great is that Anytime people are submitting photographs to an archive, they uh, submit what they think was the best that they did. And these are just uh, uh, Lauren McClanahan, with credit to her, um, some, uh, a sample of some of those photos. So again, this is the Florida Keys, lots of Goliath groupers in the 50s. This is the sport fishing from this family. Um, traveling into 1960s, here's the 70s. The early 80s, things have already kind of changed. You can see that snappers have taken over where, where the Goliath grouper once was. The fish are smaller. This is the photo she took while she was there. So this is just to show you that these species are not extinct. Uh, the Goliath grouper is on the endangered species list. It still lives and breathes. But it is not in the same numbers, performing the same ecological role as it once did. And uh, this, to me, is very conspicuous. We have the photographs to show it. But it's something that most of us don't sort of, I think, think about regularly. The final category of extinction um, is one that economists came up with, uh, economic extinction. And it was this idea that uh, species would become so rare that they would be difficult to find and pricey to find, and that finding them would be so expensive that no one would go out to hunt them. And um, a lot of work out there has, has disproven this idea of economic extinction on the fact that rarity actually increases value. And some of the species, um, or, or some of the, ex the experimenters who have worked with this have done some very clever things to show that um, rare species, which are the darker bar, people are more willing to climb stairs. This was in a zoo in Paris. They're more willing to climb stairs to see rare species. They're more willing to get wet with a sprinkler. They're more willing to pay to see rare species. They're more um, willing to uh, spend time looking at them. And they did all of these things to just sort of show the psychological tendencies. And this perception that rarity increases value has had some very um, <coughs> negative impacts on species. Because conspicuous, uh, or sorry, uh, the, the fact that rarity increases value also shows then um, your, your wealth to, to your audience, or um, increases the likelihood that you'll, you want to collect wildlife, essentially. So when wildlife becomes really, really rare, often its value goes up so much that rather than economic extinction at all, the price is so high, as in the case of bluefin tuna, that over-exploitation is the most likely outcome. And the people working on this actually call this the anthropogenic Ali effect. So this aspect of the work where rarity increases value, I think where it gets interesting is in this conspicuous angle. So um, where it links to conspicuous consumption, not just in terms of wildlife collection and trade, 
um, stag beetles, obviously all these large mammal furs. Um, but also in the issue of, let's say, shark fin soup that you serve at your wedding. Uh, so that's a very common tradition in Chinese culture. And in cases, and it's, it's done to show the very act of serving shark fin soup is to show uh, your generosity because sharks were, in the case uh, back in the previous eras, very dangerous to catch and therefore very rare. And it was meant to, to display this generosity to your guests, conspicuous display. Now, the thing about shark fin soup, uh, they come from sharks, not surprisingly, and they come from sharks from all over the world. So trying to focus the conservation efforts on the supply side is quite difficult. And a lot of sharks come from the tropics as well, where we know governance structures are not as much in place. And so um, in the case of conspicuous consumption with wildlife or um, rare, rare species in general, um, then we can sometimes need to figure out, I think, whether to focus on the supply side or on the demand side of the equation as opposed to on the demand, as I was mentioning, is mostly for shark fin soup at, at weddings. Sharks are also caught in bycatch for the, the seafood we eat, though, too. Uh, and some, in some rare cases, this was a store in Hong Kong that I was in. They, these are sawfish, um, which are a form of shark. Uh, again, their the bony appendage being used as a conspicuous display of wealth. And I think in these, the cases with these species, not only can we look at demand, but we can look at using how we can use reputation to change people's norms and values. In the, because we also know that rarity increases conservation value. And that's exactly what uh, a friend of mine did in Vancouver. She was in her early 20s, just got really concerned about the issue of shark fin soup and is uh, of Chinese birth. And she launched a wedding competition and just with no resources at all, just um, out, of her, out of her parents' basement, essentially, between uh, wedding couples that they could, on Facebook, submit a, a sort of plan and proposal and video about not serving shark fin soup at their wedding, why they were doing that. And then the community would vote on which couple they, they liked the most, and those, that couple would go get a free honeymoon to swim with sharks. And her campaign, which was, again, very low resource, just a lot of, of her tenacity, really latched onto this idea of reputational benefits from not serving the wild species. And what's great about it is some people said, oh, well, there, there could be a black market then. You're moving, you might move it underground. But it's conspicuous consumption. The whole reason to have shark fin is to show your wealth. So the idea of this becoming some sort of black market idea is, is very unlikely. And as a result, this, this tactic, which uh, she started in 2010, has spread to places like Hong Kong, um, where the demand's even greater. And I think the potential, again, for um, reputation and shame and honor and uh, using that conspicuous element of the wildlife trade and, and shark fin and, and species like that plays a real potential in the future for saving them. Thank you.